Welcome to your sophomore year at the Tragedy Academy, where you are the teacher and we are the students. Together, we learn from past tragedy to lay the foundation for a better humanity. The only supplies you'll need an open mind and a sense of humor. So, tilt that chair back, talk out of turn, and never raise your hand. Because this is the Tragedy Academy and class in session. And I'm pure Scott. Oh, excuse me. That was me being professional. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mean, the cartoon philosopher. Yes, I am. I am the self-proclaimed cartoon philosopher. My um, The intern, uh, Bonapino, that used to be on the show, um, Jonah, he used to love because normally when I'd burp, I would say I would say the word burp as I burped and he just would crack up laughing all the time. Hi, welcome to the Tragedy Academy, a show created to bridge societal divides in a judgment free zone using candor and humor. My name is Jay and today I am joined by the great Ben and Dykstra. How are you doing today, Ben? I am doing wonderful, Jay. It's a pleasure to be on here. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Ben's here to discuss uh, quite a few things. He's a busy man, but he has a unique perspective on life in that he has cerebral palsy um, and doesn't view it as a limitation in life. He has a unique perspective on that. And also he is an up and coming voice actor and also um, recently appeared in what was it? A Christmas story in a virtual play. Yes, it was a virtual performance of A Christmas Carol uh, put on by a New York theater company called Alpha NYC. Dude, did I say A Christmas Story? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> That's I, awesome. Yeah, that leg lamp gets me every time. Dude, this is one of my favorite Christmas movies of all time. Yeah. And I think it's everybody's. Everybody's. So you played, who did you play again? I played young Ebenezer Scrooge who gets dumped by Belle after he becomes obsessed with money. And then I become the one guy when the old Scrooge dies that says, well, I'll go to his funeral if lunch is provided. <laughs> it's like he's only worth a free lunch guy when he's having his epiphany moment with the uh, the ghosts. Oh, yeah. That's too funny. So, Ben, why don't you tell everyone, uh, all the listeners, what your philosophy is behind having cerebral palsy and being angry at the universe and how you approach that. Right. It can be very easy to become angry at the universe for a different situation like that. Knowing all the several episodes of your show, I remember you talking about body dysmorphia and your struggles with uh, personal issues. And it can be very easy to get bitter about that. But I'm going to steal a line from one of my favorite movies, The Shawshank Redemption. You can either get busy living or you can get busy dying. God, so I love that movie, by the way. You couldn't have quoted a better movie. Amazing, amazing movie. Keep going. Right. So in my head, I developed a philosophy that we all go through life wanting things that we don't necessarily have. Like, for instance, people ask me, would you walk if you could? Or you might want a six pack or an eight pack of abs. But the thing is, that's not what the universe gave you. The universe gave you other things, which is why I developed the theory of the universal trade-off. Like, for instance, sure, I can't walk without holding on to a walker, but I have an upbeat personality. I can talk, whereas there's other people who have far worse versions of cerebral palsy, considering it's an entire spectrum where they can't feel anything, they can't talk, they can't see very well. So I believe that it's part of my life's goal to showcase everyone else's gifts so that you don't see the disadvantage or you cannot be denied for having such a disadvantage. I think that's an amazing philosophy. And so you're talking about highlighting the capabilities, not the quote unquote incapabilities. Right. What are the, you know, what are the talents? Where is it that, it, you know, it comes from? Who are you? How you impact the world for what you bring to the table, not what you're perceived to have not brought to the table? Um, I think my talents, they just come from a general desire to be freely able to express things. Because when you have 
cerebral palsy, you get told no, or it's not likely going to happen an awful lot. Like in terms of in order to eat at a restaurant, I often have to take the foot plates off my chair because the tables are too short and I'm six feet tall when I'm sitting down. So it's a matter of like, okay, we have to adapt and overcome. So that's a common thing. I've always had the overactive imagination because most of the time at home, I'm sitting in front of a television screen. Yeah, I, that makes perfect sense when you have a sedentary life that you have to live. And I, I don't think we mentioned you live in Canada, a little bit more remote area as well, correct? Oh, yeah. For the last five years, I've lived in a town called uh, Halliburton, Ontario, which is basically if you're elderly and loaded, that's where everybody lives. If you're retired and you're just on the way out to cottage country. That's that's the area you're in the retirement village. We have that. We have something like that here uh, near where I live. It's called the villages. I was going to say your entire state's called God's waiting room. So it really is. I think the uh, the phrase is newly wed or nearly dead. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's how they um, that's how they put it on the billboards here. Um, That said, so you are saying that you view your situation as advantageous in ways based on how you get to approach things with your gifts. Uh, Can somebody pull out a dictionary? Because that was a lot of words. (laughs) (laughs) So you consider yourself someone to have capabilities, not incapabilities. Right. And there is going to be in your life, whether you have a disability or not, days where those things bring you down. Of course, it's human nature to have an off day. But the important thing is, is that you recognize that, first of all, it could always be a worse situation than what you have. Like, you could be dead, for one. (laughs) And then you have to recognize that the only person that's really going to stop you is you. You have to recognize that it really isn't anyone else's fault except your own, that you're not achieving things. That's a great philosophy because the only thing standing between you, your goals, your dreams and destinations is action. Action is the only thing that you need to take in order to achieve your goals. Not anything but that. You can stare at them. You can dream about them. You can talk to your friends about them. You can come up with all the excuses in the world to not go for them or why you shouldn't. But at the end of the day, it really was only a step forward that you Mm -hmm. needed to take in order to begin your journey. Yep. You want to, you know, pursue life the way that it's been given to you. Do you find that being authentic in your imagination and how you approach your art, do you find that that is giving you success or that's helping you with your goals? Well, first of all, when it comes to something like that, for anyone who is also in my field, which is voiceover, audio narration, stuff like that, you are not going to be successful overnight. David Attenborough, Keith David, they were not successes overnight. So if you're not willing to do the work, get out now while you still have your dignity. So you still have to work your butt off like you were a starving dog. Like, for instance, I have, I've got more credits this year than I ever have in my two years of doing this. And that's because I never stop auditioning. I have auditions done every day. Like, there's a site called Backstage. That's how I found you guys. Um, I usually have like 20 auditions or 30 auditions at a time that I've applied for. Why wouldn't you? Once you accept, see, I think what people don't understand and what or not what people don't understand, what I'd like people to notice is that when you accept the cards that have been dealt to you, then and only then can you authentically pursue things without having the fear of rejection. Once you accept yourself, rejection is not an issue anymore. On top of the fact that if you're doing something you love, that you truly are passionate for, it's not really work anyway. It will be laborious, but it won't be something that you don't enjoy doing. Right. It's a challenge every day if you really love it. It's not in any way, well, it can be for like five minutes. It's kind of sad when it's like, 
you know, audition for the book. This is your 50th audition that you didn't quite get. And it's a book you really like. Then it's like, you have to pretend that there's always the next one. But that's the thing. It, it wasn't that one. It didn't need to be that one. It wasn't yours in the first place. I've often found that the more that I try to find something, the farther it gets away from me, mm. the less the less I'm able to find it. That said, when I've sat still and done what feels natural to me, the opportunities come to me. Right. There, there it goes back to the authenticity. When you're authentic to who you are, you're really not going to have to wait as long as you think. No, because it's not forced opportunities. Nope. Anytime that you're not being authentic or original or to, you know, yourself, you're taking away the opportunities that naturally exist for you in reality. You're forcefully dodging what was already entitled to you. You're actually dodging it because you're actively chasing things that are not on your path. And we will toil and we will try to grab those false dreams, you know, those false goals, those things that we're told that we should get. And we'll toil away all that time. We'll toil yeah, it away. And you don't get it back. No, time, time is not given back to you. That is for sure. And I'm glad I figured this all out. Like I'm only... I'll be 24 in five weeks, literally. So I'm kind of surprised at myself sometimes that it's like, how am I figuring this out while other people are kind of still struggling on the, on the journey? Well, you're measuring the ability to have perspective in years, whereas difficulties, traumas, experiences, once they're layered over each other, they create a different view. I know you've heard me say before that ben, Fra ben Franklin's bifocals, right? The ones with the different lenses, and we call those experiences. And your set of experiences, whereas I might have 45 years worth of lenses and, you know, individual experiences throughout there, mine might be a lighter shade. They mm -hmm. might take me a longer time to get to the same view Whereas yours are 24 bright red lenses that you've had to look through each and every time. Your experiences are completely different. That's why people can come out of situations with profound insight, epiphanies or spiritual awakenings, you know, from traumatic events and things like that. It's because it's, it's not how long you've been here. It's what you've been through. Hmm. Yeah, that does make sense. I would imagine that someone in your situation would have a better understanding than I would. You know, that's it, it, it would only make sense. Not that you should, but I think society has been designed in a way to make it seem as if you come out, you know, owing yourself like at a, at a negative balance compared to your peers, which is not true. It's not true in the slightest. No, I don't really owe myself anything. No. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Just to respect yourself. Yep. Nothing more, nothing less. So you had talked to me about an idea for a podcast that you wanted to do involving the universal trade-off. Right. Can you tell us about what that would look like? Well, um, first of all, uh, we're still under development, so I'm hoping that in 2022 we can get that going. But what it would be like is, regardless of whether it's physical, mental, if it's any disability that society today would consider a disadvantage, I want to prove all of the people that tune into the show, it is not a disadvantage at all. There is hidden talent behind it that you cannot see, and I'm going to showcase it. <laughs> I love that. So you're going to talk about those things that are behind the scenes that people don't see. So if somebody has, you know, an inability to do one particular task, they might have developed an ability in another area based on the fact that they had overcome that particular situation. Exactly. Like, for example, in my own experience, we tried a whole bunch of different stuff growing up, like different musical instruments, different exercises to try to keep me active. I normally tend to find that uh, doing my own voices is a better 
more comfortable, more natural type of talent that I can use. And it's a way that you cannot use my disability against me because it's from home and you can't see me. Not that I'm hiding it, but it's the fact that I am making sure that nobody in today's society, regardless of their perspective, can use it on me. So let me ask you this. I, I wholeheartedly understand what you're saying, but I would want to caution having roadblocks to prevent someone from accepting you as you are today, right? In order to protect your capability to produce particular items or to be accepted to certain roles or, or things like that. You know, but when you say that you've put together these different, you know, methods with which to prevent someone from judging your capabilities, I would argue that there, the more that you work on the authenticity, the less those need to exist. Because like you were saying before, the only, the only thing between us and our dreams is action. And it doesn't matter whether or not we attract people to us or roles to us. What matters is the types of people that we attract to us and roles that we attract to us. So the reason why I say this is if those walls were taken down, imagine it like this. Would you want a friend that didn't like people in wheelchairs? Nope. So why would you want to be affiliated with a company that you feel you would need to hide it from to begin with? And I'm using wheelchair as an example, whatever. Right. right. It, that's, it's not necessarily. So you see what I mean? Like any kind of prevention between that and that, it's, I feel like I would, I've tried to use certain scenarios where a disability can be utilized as a filter, a filter with humanity. When you have what is perceived as a disability, there are, there are several different looks that you're going to get from people. You're going to get those people that, you know, will pity you, some that will look down on you. Some that'll, but to me, that's, that's like wearing a shirt that says, I suck, right? The, the people that are making the judgments. And that's not the people that I even want to do business with. Right. right? So I, I don't know. This isn't a lecture. I'm just trying to encourage you to be forward in... Or more on display. I, I mean, obviously, you're rolling media or rolling dragon media. That is, that's pretty pronounced as to, you know, who you are. But I just wanted to give that advice. Fair enough. I mean, it is the Tragedy Academy. I might as well learn something. <laughs> I mean, I already, I already brought the uh, teacher an apple because I'm on my MacBook. <laughs> Hey, Mac is Mac is saved. It's limped through so many episodes before. My MacBook had like no power one day. It was dragging its uh, you know mouse behind it, and it stayed on still. You know, live streaming. I was like, man, not my Windows computers in the past. Couldn't have handled it. Plus, you got to replace those like every three years. Oh, I've had mine. I think since college, which was now three years ago, I graduated. Nice. Nice. Yeah, they'll last forever. They'll last forever. Hey, academics. Have you endured life's tragedies, trials, and tribulations? Did you adapt and overcome? Do you have advice for others to pay forward and want to be a guest? Then email us a brief two to three minute video to show at thetragedyacademy.com and tell us how our academics can learn and grow from these experiences. Thanks again for your support. And now, back to class. The trade off. Where do you intend to find your guests? Well, I already have a few um, friends of mine because on Facebook, there is a cerebral palsy support group where if you are a little bit confused with like, say you're getting older and your body is changing in a way that some might not consider normal, you can ask someone else who has cerebral palsy who is a bit more experienced. You can always scour social media to find those who are equally as open as I am about their disabilities, or you can just do some general research. Like I thought at one point I might uh, do an episode where I do a commentary on the My Left Foot production. 
<laughs> what what is the my left foot production oh it's an old movie uh my left foot where a guy uh i believe he accomplishes dreams of being a musician but he has ever no feeling in anything except his foot are you serious uh, i think i've heard something of that nature like the my left foot but i've never i've never watched the movie or anything of that nature me neither actually that's why i was like i'm gonna look that up <laughs> So you picked a you picked a theme for a podcast episode based off of uh, what you've heard about a movie. That's awesome. I well, love your imagination. You gotta get spunky with it. But the guy, what would it be like to only have feeling in your left foot? Yeah, I actually watched a news broadcast, and I can't remember the exact disease, but there was a guy who was able to write his own life story, his own whole book. And the only thing he could move was his eyes. Wow. I know, right? Well, they have technology now that reads eye movements. See, that's why I feel like now is the perfect time for me to do this kind of stuff because the technology is here. There is more people who can be born safely and have disabilities. Whereas maybe back 20, 40 years ago, you're lucky if he survives getting out of the oven. So let me ask you this. You're in a wheelchair. You have a limited mobility in certain scenarios or you, you're you touting technology as a way to get out of your bubble, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think the metaverse is going to do for the disabled community? Ooh, that's a good one. Well, I think... Well, it just depends because it feels like, in my experience, there really hasn't been a large voice that reaches out on behalf of individuals with disabilities. Sure, you have your local organizations that will contribute money for expenses that you can't quite cover. But I haven't heard of many people that are willing to sit up or stand up on the podium and say, this is what it is like. This is what we need to do. Can our governments get our shit together? I couldn't agree more. Uh, I do think that there is so much more that can be done. Let me expand upon this. When I okay. say the metaverse, I'm talking about virtual experience, virtual right. real estate, virtual interactions, the ability to go beyond your disabilities in a metaverse. Okay. Do you see any advantages, disadvantages? Do you see this being a platform with which, you know, different disabilities can work from? I see it being a 50-50 platform. Whereas, okay, sure, you can go on any social media platform and speak. You can say what you want. But I'm going to quote an expression from an 80s wrestler that you might know of, Ernie Ladd. It is not enough for people to hear the noise. They must also take in the message. And that's the issue we're going to have in the metaverse because there's always a 50-50 of people who are listening and then there are the smart-ass trolls. So let me ask you a question. Of the two, uh, the person putting out the message and the receiver, which one do you have control over? I think... You have control I, over the messenger, which is you. Oh, okay. You have control over the messenger, not the person receiving the message. Right. So if that's the case, and it can't be... It, it's the case for all humans. You can only be, you know, the, the messenger in that situation, right? And you can't control whether or not somebody hears or listens to your message. So... One would argue that trying to control or force a message to be heard is a waste of time right. and efforts. So how do, we, how do we attract the right things? How do we attract the right people? How do we, uh, you know, move forward? By example, leading right. by example, your message when it's rang true, when your message is rang true, it does attract attention. And again, it attracts the attention of the people that need to hear it at the time they're supposed to hear it, where they're supposed to hear it, right? You just ring the bell. The rest will fall into place. So if you get into the metaverse, here's what I see. I see the ability to step beyond body dysmorphia, step beyond physical judgments, step beyond perceived limitations upon sight, like you're explaining yourself. 
those not just cognitive bias, but implicit bias, right? Hit my microphone like a champ here. I'm a pro. <laughs> <laughs> but implicit bias. We see this generationally. If I walked up to you in a wheelchair or somebody from my generation, and then someone from the generation above me walked up to somebody in a wheelchair, can you honestly tell me, because I've seen it in my lifetime, that there is a pronounced difference a lot of the time in how someone is treated in that scenario. One is a lot, not less accepting, but a little more narrow-minded in what that person's position in life might be. Does that make sense? Right, because as technology has evolved, like if we were to meet someone from my, my generation, I don't think you would get the same reaction nearly as exactly. uh, people from your generation because in a small sense, I wouldn't say very large, more things have opened up for us. 100%. And I mean, you brought it up, your generation. Your generation actually is the backbone for this push of diversity, inclusion, and acceptance. I think my generation is here to facilitate a lot of that change for you with the wisdom that we have, right? And I think that there's a generation that's left here that is really upset because they don't understand what's going on. And that's, that's how it's unfolding at this point. Right. And I see you doing great things. I mean, what you're trying to accomplish is something that, you know, a lot of people should strive to do. So I appreciate you for trying to make your mark on society in a way that, you know, it gives people a map to their own greatness. Well, I mean, I have to say the same thing about you because with your authenticity and your sense of humor, you're giving people a map, a guideline to say that, sure, we go through adversity, but this is how we overcame it. And now we're going to ride off into the sunset with a smile on our face. Thank you. I appreciate that. And to add on to that, I want to make sure that people understand that one additional, an additional piece of this is to understand that all of those perceived issues that we have, all of the insecurities, all of the depression, all of the anxiety, those things are fallacies. And if we accept the fact that they're fallacies, then they have no ability to impact us. And that's part of this journey is understanding that implicit bias and cognitive bias based on other people's upbringings and experiences really are only the reason that they're looking at us with any kind of imperfections. Their experiences right. created our, our imperfections. Right. And negativity is taught. It is not something that you are born with. It's something globally that you're taught by generation. Mm, and it's contagious. I know. It's very contagious. People don't realize the strength in our ability to interact with each other without having physical interaction, right? Case in point, so judgment, right? Judgment mm -hmm. actually has a physical strength. What if I told you judgment could stop a car? That's insane, say, right? Yeah. You ever like, are you fucking nuts? Let's say, what legal show have you been watching? Here's how. I want you to go to your nearest stop sign where people have a tendency to run the stop sign, right? Okay. Don't grab a sign. Don't do anything in particular. Go to that intersection, sit on a sidewalk, and just look at the stop sign. Sit there. Don't say a word. Don't laugh at them. Don't point. Don't nothing. And if the person sees you, then you know, you know the difference between somebody who's going to stop and who's not going to stop. And mm -hmm. then there's the people that see you. What do they do? They probably stop and say, what the heck you doing out here? Not even that, but they'll slow the car down immediately and do the extra stop. They'll mm. do the stop. Why? Because somebody is sitting there watching them and they don't want to be caught while they're being watched. It's not going to be all of them, but there will be cars that will stop because you're just standing there and looking at them do something that they shouldn't. Yeah, our society has never liked to be judged in all of human history. Yeah, I think it's one of the first tenets of, like, the Bible, thou shalt not, or the commandments. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thou shalt not judge. I'm I'm pretty sure that's in there. I might have oh, uh, I might have misread them. <laughs> I skipped the Bible. <laughs> but as a whole, I mean, it makes sense. It really yeah. does. And I don't think that um, I don't think it means to look down on something. I think that it means to rank something. Uh, people misunderstand that it isn't a matter of thinking you're better than someone else. It's a matter of whether or not you give it a connotation of negativity or positivity. The moment that you do that, you give it a charge. You give it some kind of influence. Whereas if you just accepted it for who or what it was without judgment, you could walk through it. Right. It's weird. We're weird. We're complex animals. I know. But we're it's also analyzing head. insanity. Yeah. <laughs> Because it it's is. Yeah, it's a wonder how we survived evolving past chimpanzees. Oh, I don't know. It is kind of funny. There's an episode that had a zookeeper on, and Ooh. she was talking about the differences in the great apes. And she had gone through them. She said that you can actually tell the difference between them with one item just by handing them a screwdriver. Oh. And she went through and she explained that... Um, you know, the the gorilla would fucking eat it because he's a gorilla, you know. And then um, I think it was like the the chimp would use it as a, you know, a weapon or some shit like that. I can't remember. And then the uh, the bonobos, which is a type of great ape, uh, apparently they do everything with sex. So if you pissed them off, they would like trade the screwdriver for sex. I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> and then the orangutan, is the only one that will grab it and start using it as a tool, prying things, turning things, grabbing things, different levels of evolution. The gorilla is at this level of evolution, so they're still, you know, hitting stuff with it and sucking on the, you know, the handle end. <laughs> the next guy's doing a little more, you know, he's doing a, a, a step above that, you know, kind of, it's gradual. We were talking about how the orangutan actually is always depicted as the wise animal. Right. And now it makes sense because they're smarter. That's why they move slower. They're more calculated. It was interesting to hear that, though. Yeah. I've always loved watching nature shows. Like, David Attenborough is my idol to get into voiceover. Yeah. I know the name. Who is David Attenborough? Oh, he is a English... Um, I don't exactly know what his profession really was as far as like, is it zoologist or is it, I don't really know, but he has been doing this since the, I want to say the sixties. What so show did he longer. voice? Um, he voiced planet earth. Okay. I know who you're talking about now. He's got a beautiful voice. I know. Like I, if I'm having trouble sleeping, I'll turn him on. <laughs> it's like butter. <laughs> it's like Bob Ross. Oh, Bob Ross is such a, that's, he's, he's like blood pressure medication. <laughs> <laughs> blood I love, pressure for the soul. He really is. You know, my grandma used to watch uh, Bob Ross a lot as a kid. That's how I got, you know, the whole tiny little trees thing. Um, oh. He's I want to say he's from the Orlando area, hmm. but, um, but he passed away, obviously. Yeah. Rest in peace, Bob Ross. We love you. You and that beautiful, sweet, sweet fro. <laughs> that fro was a thing of beauty. Here we have a whole bunch of great apes in a podcast studio screwing around. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, just sitting there. Tiny little apes, tiny little apes. We're going to put some tiny little apes right here. And a little tiny little ape right there. We're going to put a screen in front of the bonobos. So we're not going to let anybody see them. And then we're going to get their x rated. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna censor the bonobos. <laughs> no, man. So I want to thank you for for coming on, Ben. I know that um, I want to give you a chance to talk about the area that you live, though, because I know that they got hit pretty hard recently. Is there anything that you wanna want to say about? Because I know that you had said some storms came through and a lot of people were hurt, and you know, no power, things like that. Oh yeah, um, we just recently like. Two days ago, three days ago, we had a provincial wide, the whole province of Ontario wide windstorm. And I'm supposed to be doing one of the three performances on the night or the next day after the or the night of the windstorm. And the Wi-Fi gets knocked out three hours before the show. 
<laughs> and we have no idea when this is coming back on. So thank God I had the director's phone number. So it's like, hey, uh, we're going to have to have somebody jump in because our Wi-Fi is screwed and I don't know when it's coming back on. So and how I, are people was, functioning without power up there with the cold? Well, first of all, it's not everybody. It's a select, like it's random, like it's really, really random, like where the power is and the power is not. Like my mom's boss has had no power for like two days, yet their office has power. So it's really weird. And there's guys just sitting on the road with their phones taking pictures of the fallen trees. It's like, what are you doing with your camera? Cut the damn thing. <laughs> Right. Now, I remember um, I was in upstate New York with the 10th Mountain Division and it was the uh, late 90s and they had like the world, the worst ice storm of all times where it just drizzled at 32 degrees for like a month. And, you know, people's antennas on their cars were as like as big around as a bat. They had so much oh, ice geez. on them. Cars had like, you know, four inches of ice all the way around them, surrounding them. You saw for like no joke, like probably six months after the ice storm, there were still broken taillights where people were trying to smash the ice off of them so they could drive their cars. <laughs> oh, my God. It, but it was see. the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Most beautiful thing I'd ever seen because it was beautiful ice all over the place, but it broke like every single light pole. So it was be beautiful and terrible at once. Exactly. But I'm from Florida. You know, a storm is here and then it's gone. It doesn't hang out for a month and turn into a, you know, something that you have at a wedding reception that could, you know, <laughs> like an ice sculpture. Yeah, I was worried this whole thing wasn't going to happen as a result of the windstorm. Well, oh. I, I hope that everybody in your uh, province there is is OK and everybody weathered it. Um, I appreciate you coming on, Ben. I can't tell you what your support means to me, what everybody needs to know is Ben reaches out all the time. And I know he's listening to the episodes and he gives feedback and talks about different things. And that's really what it's all about. It's about, you know, starting a community of people that can really discuss openly the topics that we're going over. Um, ben, you're, you're a modern day hero. Um, Aww. The fact that you brand yourself in the way that you do, and that you're going out there and setting an example for other people with cerebral palsy or disabilities or perceived incapabilities, whatever they are. Um, hold on. I just noticed you had a Macho Man shirt on. And I just want to compliment you. I think that's amazing. Ooh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see, now that I got this green screen, brother, I'm going to go on YouTube and make a bunch of promo videos. Hopefully it gets on YouTube. Not too many haters. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, we had uh, Andrew Nethery was on a while back. Um, he's the he did the documentary Bury Us, a punk rock uprising. But there's a part in there where we talk about Slim Jim and their approach to marketing because he worked with them for a while. Oh, and yeah. They brought like a 20 foot Slim Jim on the, on the subway in New York City. Oh, yeah. I saw. I heard that one. <laughs> but Slim Jim and Macho Man and all that, they had a great that was a great run they did it marketing oh yeah loved it well ben do you have uh you go ahead and give everybody your social media where they can find you where they can hire you where they can you know see some of your work it is at underscore rolling dragon underscore on instagram rolling dragon media on twitter and rolling dragon media on facebook we're gonna have all of those in the show notes as well with links to where they can find you uh, ben, dude, you're a rock star. Thank you so much Thanks. for being here. All Until right. next time, keep on rolling. <laughs> keep on rolling. Be cool and keep learning. Hey, academics. Thanks again for attending another class at the Tragedy Academy. You can show us some love by subscribing, downloading, and rating us five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Or ask Amazon Alexa to play the Tragedy Academy podcast. You can find links to all major podcast platforms and past episodes at thetragedyacademy.com. You can find us on all the majors of social media on Instagram at the Tragedy Academy 2019, on TikTok at the Tragedy Academy, and on Twitter at tragedy underscore academy, where we'll post our clips of upcoming shows, updated info, and thoughts. If you'd like to be a guest, send an email to show at thetragedyacademy.com. Keep an eye out on Instagram for Tragedy Academy giveaways. Thanks again for coming to class. And remember, be cool, keep learning.
What's up, academics? This is Jay. I'm here to talk to you about Into the AM. This is a clothing and apparel company that I came across last year that has the absolute coolest designs. And the reason why I was attracted to it is because I grew up without a lot of money, like many others, and had to shop on that outlet rack with the irregular items. Things like the fly was over four inches to the left, or the right sleeve would be twice the size of the left. It looked like I was growing horizontally. Like, it's okay, honey, you'll grow into your left arm. So you really don't get a chance to express yourself the way that you want to. You go into life, you start putting on suits, you start putting on uniforms, and you realize you'd never had a chance to truly express yourself. Enter into the AM, a team of artists and creators who share a common vision. They see clothing as a canvas to express what drives you. Since 2012, They've developed premium apparel that elevates self-expression and provides unparalleled comfort for wherever your passions take you. Into the AM's passion for change is the driving force behind their brand. They remain committed to creating products that inspire and promote self-expression by partnering with like-minded organizations focused on giving back to communities in need. Last year, they donated 1% of all revenue from their graphic tees collection to the Art of Elysium charity. The Art of Elysium is an artist organization built on the idea that through service, art becomes a catalyst for social change. For over 24 years, the Art of Elysium has paired volunteer artists with communities to support individuals in the midst of difficult emotional life changes. They currently offer 110 community programs per month, serving over 30,000 individuals per year. The only permanent thing in life is change. Supporting charities dedicated to helping those going through these changes, trials, and tribulations require a never-ending commitment. The onus is on us as creators to affect change through our true, authentic talents, and Into the AM is the model of how this is done. Their clothes are handcrafted with care. They have a team of skilled artisans that craft each garment with the highest quality fabrics and eco-friendly inks. Not to mention, these things don't shrink, they don't fade, and they fit as if they were designed supernaturally. I'm stopped every time I wear one of the graphic tees to find out where I got it. The colors attract attention from miles, and the art is nothing short of spectacular, with designs for everyone. One of my personal favorites, Twilight Maiden. Go take a look. Into the AM does all of this while putting their money where their mouth is. 30-day money-back guarantee, lightning-fast shipping, and hassle-free returns. The deals are endless. Graphic tee bundles, discount promo codes. Get over there. Check it out. I'm highlighting the tees. But I'd be remiss to not mention that if you want to walk around in the absolute most comfortable shorts, joggers, and basic tees, hit up into the end. I even wear the basics to the gym. Head on over to thetragedyacademy.com, go to our sponsors tab, and follow the affiliate link to the Into the AM store. Help support Into the AM and the Tragedy Academy by purchasing the absolute best apparel and the best designs ever. And remember, academics, be cool and keep learning.